Let's look at the skewed student tea distribution today. Hey everyone, Tino here, aka The Dirty Quant, and welcome back. So this is a distribution that uh, I guess if you could have a favorite, this is probably my favorite. Uh, I just like its flexibility. I like the way it's sort of a jack out of all trades and master of all of them. Um, so let's just uh, get it fired up and uh, show you why I love it so much. You can find this notebook and everything else that I've ever showed you on my GitHub page. This is the address. And also, if you want to carry on the conversation, dirtyquant.com. Uh, don't be shy. Sign up, have a chat, say hello. It's much easier than, uh, than doing it on the comment section here, which I also do appreciate the comments and I do my best to, uh, to reply to all of them. So I am not ignoring, I cherish every single one of you subscribers and of you commenters and of you likers as well. All right, here we go. So look, I'm typically one to avoid formulas. Uh, you know how I feel about them. There's really not much that you can learn. But look, when you look at the notebook in your own free time, you can sort of reference the two and see how did the code actually works. But look, I'm not gonna go through, uh, through the formulas now. It's essentially useless. But here is a skewed student T implementation. There are tons and tons out there. This is the Hansen 1994. Um, there's also Fernandez Steel 98, which I really like, but there are loads. So um, they all sort of fit a different purpose. Um, this is, it's pretty nice, um, but yes, let's sort of go for it. So what I've done here, um, got, managed to convert some of these uh, these notations into code. So I've got a, a skew T inverse. So this is the inverse CDF and look, we'll, we'll have a look at it sort of graphically. What does it even mean? So I've got um, inverse CDF. Uh, I've got the, the CDF, so the cumulative distribution function. And I'll do another video. What do all these things even mean and how does they all interrelate with one another? And, and the last piece of the puzzle is the PDF, the probability density function. All right, cool. So. All right, beautiful. Let's just zoom out a touch so we can see it all. Cool. So this is um, the, I uh, put this little interactive notebook together so it makes it a little bit easier to understand essentially what's going on. So here you've got the ability to look at various sort of sides, uh, sort of various characteristics of, of this distribution. Top left, we've got the inverse cumulative distribution function. What that does, it takes a number between zero and one and transforms it between, let's just say, minus three and three. It's technically plus infinity, minus infinity, but it doesn't really, really matter. Let's just say plus and minus three. Essentially, how many standard deviations, right? So it's useful when you want to say uh, transform distributions from one to another, like we did with copulas, you would use the inverse CDF. The CDF, the cumulative distribution function, essentially what it says in the name is, is, is cumulative, right? So we are building the number um, and it transforms in the say the range, let's just say it, uh, minus three to three uh, pedants, it's uh, minus infinity plus infinity, but no one's listening to you. And it transforms it to a zero one. Zero one, you can think of this sort of Y axis as it's sort of filling up, right? So it's sort of empty at this, uh, on the, on the bottom left here at the sort of minus three level, it's sort of empty. And by the time we get to sort of plus three, we're essentially at one, we're, we're completely full. And this is the way sort of it it uh, it builds, the way that sort of it fills up, right? So it's not really filling up much uh, in this side of things here, it fills up a lot and we get to one and it's sort of overly full. If you take the first difference of this CDF here, you come up with the PDF. So this is the uh, probability density function, which when most people sort of think of a distribution, I think they usually think of a PDF. This is sort of graphically the one that makes more sense. If I were to sort of um, plot a histogram of occurrences, etc., this is what it looked like, a PDF, right? These sort of numbers, you can't sort of interpret that well, I think it's sort of, what do they mean? I mean, I think one means it's more, a bigger number meaning it's more likely to occur. So this number here, zero, uh, has got probability of about sort of 0.5, right? So that is more likely than something down here, which has a probability of like, you know, 0.02, right? So that's all it's sort of telling you. The area, 
and that all of this curve is one. And really what we're trying to do uh, is, you know, you can use this to slice it up and look at the probability of things occurring, right? Um, you can't sort of do this directly in the PDF. That's why you use the CDF. And you can sort of, um, let's say, you wanted to find out the probability of something being between minus one and zero. You want to essentially find this area here, right? Under the under the curve, right? What you can do is take, take the CDF, at zero, find out all of this area under the curve, and then find the area at one, which is, let's see, let's just say approximately this, right? I find that area, do one minus the other, and now you've got the difference in two, which is essentially just that little piece there. Magic, right? Very, very easy, very, very useful. Cool. Why do I love this uh, distribution so much? Okay, it's very flexible. The, the clues really is in the name, it's skewed and it's a student T. Already student T is really flexible. It does allow you to have sort of those fatter tails, which, uh, you know, come up pretty often in finance, but also skewed, I mean, clues and things, it allows you to sort of have some skewness or I guess it's sort of bias away from the mean. All right, so I've got two sliders here. This is a two parameter, um, well, it's technically four, but two additional parameters. I mean, you've obviously got uh, mean variance. This is standardized. Uh, T, so it's, you know, mean and variance will always sort of uh, be uh, zero, one, um, but you've got also these parameters. So student T has new, that's your degrees of freedom that goes between, let's just say two and infinity. So, and you've also got lambda. Lambda is your skewness parameter, right? So what I can do, if I change that new, it should update my, it doesn't really look too different. And I, as I sort of start to, um, to bring my degrees of freedom up to, to 200, you see it, that kurtosis, nothing else really changes apart from kurtosis. Um, kurtosis of three means that it's normal. Kurtosis is essentially your, your peakiness or how flat you are. Three is essentially normal. Look, I could make that 250, whatever it is, and it would be essentially three, right? So now with these parameters of a new degrees of freedom of 200, zero skew, we have a normal distribution. Everyone that's watching this video um, should be familiar with that, right? Happy days. Look, interesting what happens as we go down and make this a little bit smaller. I'm going to use my keyboard here. These numbers start to change. Already, uh, we no longer have a kurtosis parameter. It's not defined, right? Um, because it's only defined for values of new degrees of freedom above four. As I start to push that below three, all of a sudden I also have no skew parameter. It's undefined, very interesting. The lower bounds for this is two and it starts to really, really, really peak up. All right, so 2.1, it really sort of changes its shape and it's really obvious in this uh, CDF as well. It's sort of really, really steep. There's only a very small area in which it sort of climbs really quickly. Uh, and there's nothing beyond say, you know, plus and one, minus one standard deviation. All of the area is essentially contained here, but we've really pushed out the tails. Uh, essentially what we've done by reducing that degrees of freedom, it might not appear, but there's actually more more area here that things happen are more likely to happen here in these tails. So if I bring this up a little bit, right? And what I've also got is the lambda parameter. And that is essentially a skew. And that's very, very obvious. When I introduce that, uh, you know, negative skew, you start to see the sort of, um, that the, the amount of area is really skewed to the left. There's a lot less, there's a lot less on the right. Looking at that peak, there's a lot less here. There's a lot much larger area. So you're seeing, look, things on the left uh, are actually much more likely to happen. And obviously it's symmetrical, so you can start to look. If I bring it all the way to 99, very, very interesting thing. Essentially things below, let's just call it minus 1.3, they they just don't happen. You know, that's very, very unlikely to happen. And that's reflected in this, right? So it's saying, look, uh, it's zero, 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 all the way to here, and then things start happening, right? So pretty, pretty interesting. If I reset these values, I'm gonna make that zero. Let's make that like an eight, something like that. I'm gonna add student T, I think. Where is it? I can't see it. Well, if we don't have any skewness, skewed student T becomes student T. So I can change its parameters and it's not actually there. I mean, believe me, it is. You'll only ever see it if I introduce some skewness. So now I've got the T in the, what's that, red? and uh, skewed student T in the blue. 
and uh, you know it's quite good and this little table updates with uh, the skewness and kurtosis parameters and uh, you know you can sort of start to see and that's really the flexibility that I like you can have normal you can have student t and you can have skewness it's obviously not going to be as pronounced as this this is a really sort of dumb uh, distribution nothing's really going to look like this uh, nothing really stops but you know a little bit of skewness uh, I think it's healthy right um, why I love it it's only two more parameters so it's not really that much more to compute and it can become normal and it can become student t so it's really really flexible um, drawbacks it's not a silver bullet it's not a panacea yes you can um, you know, it gives you a lot more flexibility, but people chuck it at financial data, which doesn't fit a student T and it's got sort of thing, you know, 10 standard deviations. If you're coming up with 10 standard deviations, you have misspecified the distribution. Nothing has 10 standard deviation, right? You're saying, oh, look at the Z, Z score. Uh, it's only supposed to be one in 100,000 year event. Well. It's not because it's happened twice in the past 20 years. So you're measuring it wrong, right? So this is not the, the solution uh, to your problems. It's helpful. It gives you flexibility, but it's not going to account for everything. Where are you going to be using um, you know, these, uh, these formulas? Where are these formulas very useful? Up here uh, in the, you know, the, the CDF, the inverse CDF, etc., is when we look at simulation. I'll cover that more in another episode, but look, I've just got a quick example here. Cool, so I've got this um, random distribution, uh, so uniform random distribution I've got from NumPy, happy days. I've called it U. It's not really much to look at. It's just gonna look like a block of data from zero and one. Then what I can do, I can throw it into that PDF. So that's gonna give us this, uh, this chart on the bottom left. Uh, I could chuck it into the inverse CDF. So it, it's gonna look something like this. So I've started from and that's how you simulate data. You start from a zero one and then you chuck in the inverse CDF of the distribution that you want, right? So now I've got simulated um, skewed student T data because that's what I wanted. I've, I've input my data, I've input my parameters here. So I've got two inputs, uh, new and lambda, new being your degrees of freedom, lambda being your skewness. You know, I can say, look, it's got a skewness of that. Boom, it updates the data. And now I've got, you know, real life uh, data to, to, to play with. And that's sort of a pretty, pretty much it. Look, I'll, um, I'll do some more videos on terms of like, you know, using this in simulation, transforming, and also how these three uh, transformations all interrelate to each other and when should you be using what because I get it it's confusing at the beginning because inverse CDF PDF um, they're sort of quite abstract concepts but I'll, uh, I'll do my best to try and help you out hope you enjoyed this video and I'll catch you in the next one cheers bye